I showed you a bit of my office before, but I wanted to show you the, the working part because it's an interesting way that artists can work now. You know, I was in the computer business. I started in 1960 when it was just nothing, just a bunch of vacuum tubes in a big room. Of course, now that that's all changed and the computer power that's available is just immense. This is a video I made for a woman in Mexico that you're looking there. I can work on three or four things at once. These things take some time to render down. You know, it's all bits and bytes that compose the picture. So from time to time, you you can be working on them. And it's a little like the story about Napoleon always had four or five stenographers around so he could dictate the law as quickly as it came to him. He would have all these computers around him today, and that's what I have. Um, this is a video I made some time ago. It's a beautiful one. That man always reminds me of my father, that prince, that medieval prince. Uh, but that's always going on, and I was doing some editing on that this day, and I had, had something going on, the DVD, to see how it had it rendered. That's always going on. This was a audiovisual poem set in Mexico. Um, which came out extremely well and those things are put together very quickly I don't know how to describe it but you can put together today pictures and music very 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 quickly with computers it's not like the old days I made movies in the old days um, let's say before computers way before computers got to this power it was all done by hand with film hanging from ceiling and things like that I was involved in that in the computer business uh, but here I can be surrounded by four or five computers and they're all you're chugging away and you're doing things. It's very easy. And this is a little view outside of my office. I love it. It's, uh, I'm up in the trees. I still love tree houses. I haven't outgrown them. And this is my place in Pelican Cove. I like it very much. It kind of looks out and I can see the world. And then I can pull back into my office and get to work on something that's need some attention at that particular stage, whatever it happens to be, you know. So it's it's a way of being surrounded by helpers. <laughs> Strange to say that they're a pain in the neck sometimes, as anybody knows who uses them constantly, but it's a way in which you can create something very close to reality, you know. It gives the ability motion pictures and your television are spellbinding to the unconscious. That's because they're a very close replica of reality, at least on the physical level, you know. Uh, whereas a play is not, or just your music alone is not, or somebody, you're writing a poem is not, but when you combine them all into one piece, this is a performance piece that I won some prizes for with my partner, Scylla, that I was just looking at there. And uh, some documentaries that were set in Mexico, and again, just pictures of my office, you know, which I sometimes use as a, background for a poem, it's there. And here's some sculpture by Jorge Alvarez. I did a short documentary on him. He's a Mexican singer and composer and sculptor. He's a wonderful guy. Anyway, I have my fish to rescue me. I always have a chance to look up through them and get lost for a while, and then I eventually head back into the real world, which always awaits me, unfortunately. Just to think about the things I dislike makes me kind of you know, rev up because I just want to count them off one, two, three. But as a matter of fact, they all come down to the way that you know we're currently living in this culture. It goes from the very smallest things where you go to a restaurant to eat and you have somebody who's continually interrupting you while you eat, asking you if your food is okay to the point where you come in, you have to know their name, they want to tell you their name, and they want to recite a long list of foods that are special, and I, I never saw why they couldn't put it on the menu as they do in Europe. It's just a, one constant interruption of a server into your life. Servers are 
is supposed to serve, I always felt, you know, and I don't know whether it's that I'm eating in cheap restaurants, but I suspect it's taking place everywhere, is that you're just assaulted with salesmanship from the time you walk in to the time you leave. It makes the meal for me very uncomfortable, and I very seldom will you know, go out as a result. I don't you know, like that. It's part of, let's make the customer spend some more money, tell them your name, they'll love you, and tell them all the specials you have. You know, we can read. You know, we're you know, college graduates. So that right there, just in going out to eat, I like to eat. I'm, I don't want to be fed by a, a corporation and you prattle that by some insane teenager all night long while I'm eating my dinner. So that's my first dislike. It's the way that everything has been you know, commercialized in our culture. It's a really sad day when you can't have a meal without being assaulted. So I make it a practice to only go to restaurants where I happen to know the owner and I like the owner and he likes me and they like to feed me. You know? Then I would say that, that uh, in terms of my likes, I like to eat. I don't have any particular your favorite food as long as it's tasty. I don't have to have the latest, you know, that's out with all the curly cues and everything. I just want some good food that's cooked by people who happen to like to cook. And I like to sit with friends and to eat, usually informally. You know, I don't like those big formal business lunches. I hated those when I was in the business world and all the rest of that nonsense we had to go through. And in terms of my likes, also, I, I like my family, you know, that's, you know, sometimes you, you meet people who say, well, I don't really like my family, or we're not really you know, talking. I'm only really comfortable around my own children and my brothers and sisters and their children. There's something about that, those you know, qualities that they have that make me feel at home. I like it. I, love being with them, I love laughing with them, we share the same sense of humor, we share the same you know, quickness, there's a respect, they've been brought up on my brothers and sisters, who just the same way that I was, they have good values, they're bright, they're curious. So I would say on the top of my list of likes today are my kids and my family and all of those generations that go back that I see at family reunions or weddings or birthdays or in fact whatever we get together. One high point was back in my college days where I won a medal for swimming. I was a competitive swimmer. I swam distance. I didn't start swimming early competitively so I was at a big disadvantage in that. But somehow I had some natural ability. It wasn't great, but I was able to win a, a bronze medal. It, it was the August O. Eimer Award for all-around best swimmer at Columbia, I, I guess in 1961. No, it'll be 1959 because I, 57 because I graduated in. 60, so it was my second year of swimming. I still have that medal. It's a bronze medal, a very fancy one, you know, with the Columbia alma mater like this. I don't know how I ever won it because I wasn't that great a swimmer. I was pretty good. I was a good freestyler. My backstroke was so, my breaststroke was horrible. My butterfly was okay. But that was a high point. I was you know, just thrilled by that. And at the same time, that was the same year that I got my varsity letter too, which was also thrilling because I was not an athletic kid. I hadn't played any athletics in grade school or college outside of the usual stickball or baseball, whatever it was, you know. Two other high points that you come to me were my first marriage and my second marriage. And by that I mean you're marrying my your first wife, your Sharon, was a high point for me. That I hoped that that marriage would you know, work, but it didn't. It wasn't Sharon's fault, but it was my fault. It was just too self-absorbed or selfish or stupid, whatever it was. I didn't really know what to do to make a marriage work, you know. And then 
The second high point was when I married the second time, my second wife, and Pauline, who was a wonderful woman as well. You know, they were two wonderful women. I didn't quite know how to make that one work either, and if I figured if I couldn't make it work with that woman, I just wasn't going to be able to make it work, and I kind of gave up my thoughts of marriage. But those were two high points for me. It was as though I had something had happened that was of a higher order. I had met somebody that I had something in common with, that I loved, I respected them, and it looked like a whole new world was going to open up in front of me, and it did, uh, but it closed in both cases. It didn't go on. I have three children. My oldest is my daughter Margaret, who is a lawyer now in Washington, D.C. in the Senate. And she's an environmental lawyer, so she's into everything, you know, and she's big into archaeology and to the oceans and fisheries. That's her particular specialty. And then my son, Justin, who we call J.D., uh, he's an art writer and he's an award-winning art writer and I don't know how many books he has out, but if you Google him, you, it's amazing as to how many books you can produce on your contemporary painters you know, over a, a span going back to the 40s and 50s or so. He's also a pretty good artist and he's a pretty good novelist. And my son Art, who is the youngest, and they're only separated by about a year apiece. There's about two years between my daughter Margaret and my son Justin, and about a year, a little less than a year by a day, from my son Arthur, who is a wonderfully accomplished and highly socialized businessman. He, he was the first of the springs I, uh, I felt who was not outside the world. You know, my, my son Justin and my daughter Margaret have a little bit of me. I'm kind of outside of the general stream of the culture, the society. I guess that's the best way to put it. I don't see myself in the middle of the pie, but my son Art, I think he recognized immediately that this was a big pie and he wanted his share, you know, whatever it took to get that share. And he found in a business, he's highly successful at it. He's a wonderful doer. He just gets things done and he just starts from zero and uh, he's a fantastic sales guy. He's made lots of money and then he moved into his own corporation where they helped other corporations streamline their computing operations. But he, but he, but he's the kind of guy who, who works well in the world as it's situated, whereas I think that all the rest of us have been always just sitting outside and taking a look at it, you know.